Hi all, and welcome to Physical Attraction. Now, this week and next week, we're going to have episodes that are a little more loose exploration of some different themes, and maybe a little bit more opinionated than usual, so I hope you forgive me for that. In general, the link that I'm going to be talking about here is going to be about the interactions, parallels, and connections between the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and the situation with climate change. The first thing I want to address here, unfortunately, is the parallels that show up in the politicisation of the two issues. I want to get this rant out of the way so that I can talk about some more interesting stuff later on, but I feel that it's illustrative of a few important things to talk about, and it'll probably make me feel better about climate COVID deniers and some of the similar tactics that they use. The first thing to say is that science is uncertain. The science of a developing situation like this pandemic or like climate change is doubly uncertain. You're pushing a system beyond the range that you've usually observed it in, so you have to expect that there are going to be some behaviours and some responses that you can't anticipate. Both for coronavirus and climate change, we're seeing something totally new that hasn't been observed before. The legitimate thing to do, then, is to start from a position of ignorance and try to build up on that. We need to rely on mathematical models, driven by the data and by our best understanding of the science, because in both cases we can't run experiments on the whole population or on the whole planet. One of the ways you can tell honest actors from dishonest actors is that the honest actors will admit their uncertainties, and they'll tell you how that those uncertainties could be addressed with more data. And... In many cases, they'll probably ask for more funding to conduct those experiments to boot. What identifies climate deniers and COVID deniers alike is the utter certainty that admits no argument, even when the individuals involved stand against the vast majority of scientists in their field. Something that's worth pointing out is that some of the people who are now prominently sceptical of the severity of COVID-19 are not just similar to, but actually the exact same people who are sceptical of the severity of anthropogenic climate change. One particular individual who I won't name, people have sent me this person's paper making arguments that COVID is less severe than the epidemiological consensus. It's fascinating for me to note that their blog historically has been arguing that climate change is less severe than people think, until suddenly they switched to being an epidemiologist in the last few weeks. It did not surprise me at all to see the same person arguing once again that the fatality rate for COVID was on the lowest end of possible estimates or well below, just as it didn't surprise me to see them arguing for years that climate sensitivity, the amount of warming we should expect due to adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, was at the lowest end of estimates. When you see someone who consistently argues that everything is fine and human intervention to prevent a tragedy is unnecessary, someone who used to work for the financial services industry and doesn't have any experience in climate science or epidemiology to boot, you do have to wonder about that person's motivations. Part of the parallels, and this applies especially to commentary at people in newspapers and so on, uh, arise from a particular kind of conservatism. Maybe the person's ideological bent is that they're sceptical of any kind of institution, such as the government. Maybe it's the case that they think that addressing climate change or the coronavirus would stifle businesses and productivity, and ultimately it would be bad for the economy. This can be a sincerely held belief, or it can be advanced on behalf of given organisations. In the latter case, you can usually see it. For example, former oil and gas engineers who are suddenly interested in climate modelling or have a pathological fixation with renewables. In the COVID case, we now have a paper circulating that has been produced by the investment bank JP Morgan. One again has to wonder why people from investment banks have become epidemiologists, and what they think they'll gain by publishing a particular conclusion. The real irony here, and what continues to depress me, is that these things should really not be politicised to the extent that they are. It's in everyone's interest to have an effective response to climate change and coronavirus. For example, if you're concerned with the economy, climate change-related disasters are bad for business. It's also very bad for business to have an entire economy that depends on a finite, exhaustible resource, which has all these negative externalities and effects when it's burned, which is geographically concentrated in a few countries, which tends to lead to conflicts over resources, unstable supply chains, fluctuating prices, and so on. The carbon bubble could be one of the biggest things to pop and cause future recessions and financial crises in various different markets. Similarly, the perception that the COVID-19 pandemic is out of control could well be far worse for demand and for business than the attempts to control it. I'm not saying that my position is right on every issue, and that everyone who disagrees with me is wrong. That would be ridiculous. Science is about scepticism, and that means there should always be sceptical voices arguing the other side of the case to keep everyone else honest, and to point out the flaws and uncertainties in their arguments. But I feel like that even within that context where we want people to be sceptical, and we want people to be critical of the consensus, there are valid and invalid arguments, and genuine and disingenuous positions that people take on a given topic. If you think that the cost of addressing climate change 
is going to be worse than the cost of enduring whatever climate change has to throw at us. That's an argument that people can have. But if you choose to hide from the argument you want to make, it's not worth trying to prevent this, behind an argument that says, actually, everyone's wrong and climate change is not a big deal, it's hardly going to cause us any problems at all, then I think that's disingenuous. And you can replace climate change with COVID in those sentences, and it's equally true. I would rather people debate about what they really think, rather than muddying the waters with a combination of cherry-picked data and wishful thinking to pretend that their actual argument is different. The issue here is a subtle one, something a little bit like the difference between scientific advice given to governments who then decide policy, and the difference between scientists directly setting policy themselves in some kind of purely evidence-based technocracy. Effectively, when you see someone who doesn't like what they see as the implications of the science, and therefore chooses to reject the science and not the implication, you're seeing this mistake. Take evolution. Some people reject the theory of evolution because they think it means that God does not exist and therefore that their life has no meaning or that their religious beliefs are wrong, for example. Presenting someone who has these beliefs with endless evidence about the theory of evolution, scientific papers, etc. is not going to change their mind on the topic. Because it's not actually a question of evidence or beliefs on the scientific question, but the philosophical one that is associated with it. You're more likely to be successful by persuading the person that evolutionary theory is perfectly compatible with the existence of a god. Similarly, in climate science, we see people rejecting the science of climate change because they think it will inevitably result in the government imposing on their lives, forcing them to drive or fly less or eat less meat, pay more in taxes, or prevent them from working in the fossil fuel industry. This makes sense because people don't actually have strong, deeply held emotional beliefs about the validity of the greenhouse effect or the water vapour feedback effect or the validity of temperature records that are being kept. But fear of the implication of the science is obviously a bad reason to reject the science, in the same way as loving smoking or unhealthy food is a bad reason to reject the science surrounding how these things will impact your health. Instead, from that perspective, you're better off saying, well, I think that the benefit I get from smoking is worse than the consequences to my health, and I want to have the freedom to be able to do that. But that's a different argument to saying that smoking isn't bad for you. We've talked about how sceptics will often use the scientific uncertainty against scientists. A quote that sticks with me so often about why scientific writing, in the context of journals especially, is frequently awful is this one. Scientists write for a tiny audience of experts in the field who are trying to destroy them. This, more than anything else, is what I wish non-scientists understood about science. If you present a new idea to a group of scientists in a paper, in a conference, in a talk, they will not congratulate you if it backs up their pre-existing beliefs. They will pick at it, they will attack it, they will go for every logical hole and every possible counter-argument, they will find every flaw and caveat in what you've done, and make sure that you include all of that in the paper, or scrap the thing entirely. It is an often brutally self-correcting process. That's why you should trust scientists in the scientific consensus. Not because scientists are necessarily smarter or better than anyone else. Not because they're the high priests of a religion, but because of the sheer levels of scrutiny that most things have to go through before they become widely accepted. For this reason, scientists often express a great deal of uncertainty. Anyone listening to my shows on COVID will know that I've used the word uncertainty more than virtually anything else, that I've tried not to be alarmist and I've tried to put both sides of any given argument, even when I thought it was unlikely to be valid. When I find a new piece of information that contradicts what I've said before, such as, for example, when I learn more about network effects and heterogeneity in epidemiology, which might lower the herd immunity threshold, I've introduced that new information into my discussion because I'm most concerned with what everyone should be concerned with, which is getting to the truth scientifically that will allow us to mount the best possible response. I certainly don't think every aspect of what governments have done, or what scientists have advised, has been the optimum solution. I hope that people don't listen to me and feel like I'm desperately trying to defend a single position, and that they can hear I'm willing to talk about uncertainty, albeit with my own opinions clearly more prominent. What you see with the less genuine arguers those with a political or other motivations, say, is that they will never admit to the same level of uncertainty. And to the untrained eye, that can seem like they're more certain about what they're talking about. A New York Times writer, Mark Mazzetti, observed this phenomenon. He said, quote, The odd thing about reporting on the coronavirus is that the non-experts are supremely confident in their predictions, while epidemiologists keep telling me they don't really know much at all. Or, as Bertrand Russell put it, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. 
and I find it very distressing that this is the case. Imagine you were arguing, say, that smoking or asbestos didn't cause cancer. You're arguing there against a general consensus. If you're wrong, you're arguing for policies that could kill more people. This is literally true of climate sceptics and people who want to argue that the COVID fatality rate, say, is much lower than everyone else suspects. It seems a little strange to give barely any credence to any alternative views in those circumstances, because of the consequences if you're wrong. I also want to talk about a very frustrating but easy to spot tactic that's often used, which is called gish gallop, and it sort of often goes along with shifting the goalposts for the burden of proof. Essentially what happens here is that I may have one argument, one coherent case for what's happening or what should be done, and the person arguing against me might have 50. These arguments might all internally contradict each other, or they might be inconsistent, but the hope of the gish galloper is that by advancing them all at once, they can still succeed. I've had arguments with climate deniers who have literally gone from actually volcanoes emit more CO2 than humans, to water is a more important greenhouse gas than CO2, to the warming is actually caused by natural variations or cosmic rays or clouds, to the greenhouse effect isn't real, to the temperature records are being faked and there's no warming at all. So if you were actually to take all of these arguments together, someone is effectively arguing that the warming, which is actually all fake, is caused by natural variations and not CO2, which is not an important greenhouse gas. Although volcanoes emit more CO2 than people, so I guess if CO2 did cause the warming, then it wouldn't be from people, it would be from volcanoes. And also the greenhouse effect isn't real, and also there's no warming. It's incoherent on the face of it, and some of the arguments directly contradict each other. Now, I could spend all day pointing out that the isotopic evidence suggests that atmospheric CO2 is increasingly down to earth, that it's the type of carbon that you get from burning fossilised organic material, and therefore the volcano's argument makes no sense. I could point out that we know that water is a more important greenhouse gas than CO2. A big amount of the predicted climate change is because of how water vapour will change in the atmosphere, given the kick that it's initially given by CO2, and of course without water vapour's greenhouse effect we'd live on a frozen rock. I could point out all of the counter-arguments that the warming isn't caused by natural variations or cosmic rays or clouds. I could point out that the greenhouse effect has to be real to prevent us from living on that frozen rock. And I can demonstrate that the temperature records are independently verifiable from several different sources, and you would need to believe in a vast conspiracy theory to assume that they had all in fact been faked. But the point is that each of these new gish gallop arguments that is pushed onto me is asking me, it's telling me that I have to provide the burden of proof to demonstrate that something is, in fact, not true. And that can be very difficult, particularly in the case where some of the things that people are asking you to argue are, by their very nature, unknowable. A classic example would be Last Tuesdayism. Prove to me that the whole universe wasn't just created last Tuesday and we're all given false memories. Well, it's very difficult to disprove that, because whatever you might want to think about it, it's always possible for the person to elaborate that well, actually it was created in such and such a way, and uh, it expands to fill the space. So the gish gallop argument might seem to be quite weak, it's just throwing out loads and loads of stuff at the wall to see what sticks. But if this type of argument unfolds in front of people who aren't sceptical, and especially if they're already predisposed to one side of the argument, it can seem like the gish galloper won. Look, they had to spend their whole time defending themselves against the countless arguments that the other person had to make, their theory seems to be full of holes, and I'm sure that at least one of those other counter-arguments is true. Even though multiplying your arguments doesn't actually make them any better, and in fact makes your position less coherent, particularly when the arguments all contradict each other, it can seem to the untrained or biased eye that the, uh, whether the gish galloper is succeeding in what they're trying to do. It's fairly obvious when you look back at it that the consistent rational case is to advance one explanation for what we're observing, rather than six that all contradict each other. And unfortunately, you can see something fairly similar happening with COVID. One example that I will name is Professor Gupta from Oxford, who had another piece out lately that circulated in my orbit. And this is the same person behind the group that released the paper on March 23rd, which suggested that half of the UK had already been infected with COVID-19. That paper, which really expressed the most wildly optimistic case for a virus that spread very, very quickly, but was extremely mild in most cases, I gave it some of the benefit of the doubt, despite disagreeing with its conclusions, because it was couched in terms of we should do lots of antibody testing to reduce uncertainty and figure this out right away, and not 50% of people definitely have COVID. 
Since that paper was published as the Oxford model nearly two months ago as I wrote this, it's become increasingly clear that any idea that 50% of people were already immune in March was wrong. The serology testing that was asked for has now happened, and the most recent results suggested that around 5% of the UK had had COVID by May, rising to 17% in London. But Professor Gupta has now changed her argument. I'm taking this all from Unheard, where she was interviewed, and she has now suggested that serology testing that was considered to be so important in her first paper is not relevant, and that this testing doesn't contradict her idea, and that instead people are just immune due to cross-immunity from other coronaviruses, such as those that cause the common cold. So the argument now appears to have changed from the disease has already spread through the entire population and therefore probably has a very low fatality rate, let's just check with some antibody testing, to actually most people are already immune to the disease because of other coronaviruses, antibody testing is useless and doesn't contradict my theory. Now, ignoring for a second that the professor, after being proved wrong in one argument, has quickly changed to another that contradicts it, despite supporting the same conclusion, you would think that this would at least require a change in one point. If in fact most people have not been infected with COVID because they're already immune, then presumably the fatality rate should be higher than she first suggested, right? I mean, we've changed, the story that she's pushing here has changed from everyone's already had COVID and the fatality rate is tiny to most people are immune to it, but I guess you can explain the deaths. I guess that would require there to be quite a high fatality rate, right? That's the only way that it would make sense. If you're saying that these deaths are coming from only 5% of the population that's actually been infected, then the fatality rate must be as high as that would conclude it to be the case, right? But no, she doesn't admit that. She doesn't concede this point, and instead she argues that the infection fatality rate is probably between 0.1% and 0.01%, probably closer to 1 in 10,000. Given that nearly 40,000 have died in COVID in the UK already that we've confirmed, if the infection rate really was 1 in 10,000 for fatalities, it would imply that 400 million people in the UK have had COVID-19, an impressive feat in a country with a population of just 70 million. Let's be charitable and say that closer to 1 in 10,000 than 1 in 1,000 lies at the midpoint of 5 in 10,000. Then we'd still need everyone in the country to have been infected, and this by a virus that apparently most people are magically immune to anyway. It doesn't seem clear to me how a virus that everyone is immune to already can spread this quickly and to so many places with an R of at least 3 and faster than many, many other respiratory viruses have spread in the past. In response to places like New York, where the fatality rate is already running at 0.15% of the entire population, more than 15 times her estimate, assuming that everyone was infected, she simply says that, quote, where vulnerable people are gathered together, the disease can rip through them more easily. So apparently the entire state of New York is a population that's more than 10 times more vulnerable than she expects for the average person. And for some reason, the people there don't get colds or don't have this inexplicable natural immunity while the people of Denmark, which began social distancing earlier, or Beijing or Seoul, where cases have been much more strictly controlled from the start, somehow do have this natural immunity. She further argues that evidence for this is that the course of the virus has been the same in countries around the world, whether there has been a lockdown or not, which is most easily explained by a build-up of immunity in the population. So not pre-existing immunity, but immunity that arises once you're infected. What else could a build-up of immunity mean? And how can one claim that the course of the virus has been the same regardless of whether the country's locked down, when countries that locked down early, implementing testing and tracing like South Korea, has five deaths per million population, while the UK has more than 500 per million population? I think I've spent enough time on this. It seems clear to me that regardless of the merits of her case then or her case now, Professor Gupta made her mind up two months ago. And in the rest of the interview, where she talks about the social harms and economic costs of lockdown, you can see her motivations for making this case more clearly. And now she's just casting about for different arguments, even when they contradict each other, to support the general theme, this virus is less severe than everyone says. A scientific point, supposedly, that masks the underlying political or implicative point, the lockdown is more costly than it is beneficial. Now there's plenty of place for debate about whether the lockdown is more costly than beneficial just as there's place for talking about heterogeneity in networks, and a place for talking about the possibility of cross-immunity from other coronaviruses. These are all really interesting, potentially crucial topics in understanding the disease. What I don't like to see is people choosing their camps and refusing to be swayed by any new evidence, or even to address their critics directly. And I don't like this appeal to some magical, undetectable immunity that hasn't been confirmed in any scientific study, 
to explain why it just so happens that the lockdown was completely ineffective, despite the lockdown evidently being effective. And so you have the COVID gish gallop. The disease isn't going to be a problem. It's being contained. In any way, it's not that bad. It's much less fatal than you think it is. Maybe everyone's immune to it anyway. And if it isn't, then there's a cure, probably. Some of these drugs will work. And if the cure doesn't work, then there's nothing we can do because lockdowns don't work either. On the extreme end, you have people saying that the deaths are fake, which smacks of the temperature records being fake in climate change, or that everyone would have died anyway, which is much like the argument that anthropogenic climate change actually comes from natural variability. So you can see that we're used to these parallels and the willingness of people to rapidly switch between arguments, even when they contradict themselves. The difference is that a rapidly unfolding pandemic tends to prove people wrong faster than climate, which takes years and decades to get reliable data on. Yet, in both cases, it doesn't seem to change people's minds once they've decided what camp they're in. Funny how that works. In the Wingnut Fringe, we see the same things. Global warming is a conspiracy by Al Gore to sell books, or COVID is a conspiracy by Bill Gates to sell vaccines. It's ridiculous, of course, but this is where people's minds go. And meanwhile, the poor old epidemiologist is stuck saying, we're forced to tell people things even though we wish they weren't true because of public safety. Yeah. I'm going to end this episode with a little listener mailbag just to thank individual people who have supported the show by talking to us or subscribing on Patreon and answer some of the questions that I've had. Please let me know if you find this embarrassing, but I think it's worth thanking people in person rather than just generically stating that I'm grateful to listeners, since we are a small enough band of people that I can actually single you all out personally. Just a little explainer about the Patreon, because it's very irregular that I can come up with bonus content. You only pay for the bonus episodes that you get, so it's not a monthly subscription. It is a pay-as-you-go per bonus episode. I'd like to thank patrons Anne, Austin, Bruce, Dave, Froda, Hacken, Lindsay, Laura, Richard, Stephen, and Navajo for signing up to do that. I also want to thank Becky, Dave, Steve, and Jeremy from the Facebook page. In particular, Dave, for his dedicated commenting from when new episodes have shown up over the years. I hope that all of you are keeping well in the midst of this crisis. Finally, some recent emails. You can get get in contact with us via the contact form on physicspodcast.com, and I try to answer every email that I get, usually pretty successfully. But I'll single out a few here. I'd like to thank Scott for his supportive words, and in particular about our interview with Gemma Milne, Smoke and Mirrors, about technological hype. If you enjoyed that interview, don't forget you can check out her work via the Science Disrupt podcast as well. Alexander asked me about dentistry in the time of COVID-19. I have to say it's not an area I know a lot about, but I do know that episode 611 of This Week in Virology, Corona and Crowns, deals specifically with the issue of how to practice dentistry safely. As someone who's had a few brushes with the dentist in the past, I can only imagine what people are going through to get around that right now. I haven't listened to their advice yet, but what I would say is that even if you have effective filtration or disinfectants going on, I think it's difficult to do anything but reduce the risk of transmission. I think as we move on with COVID, we're going to need to make a lot more cost-benefit analyses in the actions that we take, and accept that the risk of infection is never going to be completely zero. To Anton, the literature student, thanks for the kind words, and I hope you can get back to studying and being bored on trains soon. To Jan, who emailed last month about COVID exit strategies, one of your questions was about how scalable using blood plasma from recovered patients as a treatment was. I note that to date, 7,000 people have had this treatment in the US. What's still happening are randomised clinical trials to determine just how effective it is. As Jan pointed out, at least theoretically, if R is less than 1, then you'll always have more recovered people to take blood from than you will have people who might currently need it. This is true, but I imagine that if the benefit is only worthwhile, or minor, or only worthwhile in the most severe cases, then it may be that the bottleneck is not in the blood you can get, but in the cases where it's worth the hassle of taking the blood and doing the transfusion, which I imagine is quite complicated. We also discussed uh, some contact tracing apps, which I think we've since done in much greater detail. To Sander, who asked if I could do more interview episodes, I hope you appreciate your email is part of the reason why I've done a few more lately and have more on the way. I love getting to speak to people who are knowledgeable and passionate. If anything, it's more fun than doing the scripts. But thanks for your kind words about the show. Thanks to Lucas, who welcomed me back after the hiatus. Hopefully I can avoid another one of those in the future. Thanks also to, finally, to Benjamin and Samuela, who gave me their reflections on immortality for the Who Wants to Live Forever episode, where we dived into some philosophical speculation. My views on immortality haven't changed, I still think it would end up being torturous. But the question of whether it's scientifically practical, and what it would mean if it was, is certainly an area that I think we'll come back to someday. I'm really keen to someday do a listener Q&A episode in full, because I think it would be really fun for me and for you guys. So, again, if you want to contribute questions for something like that, send them in via the contact form on physicspodcast.com. 
to my email at physicspod at outlook.com and I'll endeavour to feature them on the show someday. One thing I'm specifically interested in is how keen people are for me to do a really lengthy, in-depth series on climate change and issues surrounding that. A sort of climate 201, because I'm aware that there is a a strong uh, set of debates going on within the climate change community and the climate science community, and I just wonder how many people really understand what it is that we're talking about and whether we're not in a small echo chamber where these issues should be better known to the wider public. And I think given that this is probably the closest thing I have to a real area of expertise, I'd like to know how people would feel about that as a topic. As ever, any comments, questions or concerns that you have should go to the contact form on physicspodcast.com, particularly if you have opinions on that. Next time we'll be talking more directly about the interactions between COVID-19 and climate change. Until next time, though, take care.